Muy buenas noches y bienvenidos. Welcome to everyone to the first debate in our series, Los 100 Decisions Sonoma 2022. My name is Fernando Carrillo and I'm a board member of Los 100 and the co-chair of the program committee. Si necesita traducción, en la parte inferior de la pantalla hay un botón que dice Translation. Haga clic y va a escuchar la voz de Betsy Chávez, nuestra traductora para esta noche. Gracias, Betsy, por su apoyo. Before we begin, the work of Los Cien is made possible by our generous premier partners and sustaining members, United, United Way of the Wine Country, River Rock Casino, Barbara Grassetti, and Tony Kraft. The City of Santa Rosa, Leap Solutions, The City of Cloverdale, Sonoma Raceway, Puma Springs Vineyard, and Exchange Bank. Thanks to them for making Los Cien's work possible. We're also very grateful for Gerard Judice and Sally Tomatoes for their support. Gerard has kindly offered to share a message with us tonight. Welcome, Gerard. If you are there, please go ahead. Buenas noches, uh, Fernando, y muchas gracias por la oportunidad para hablar sobre esta uh, situación. Uh, I want to say to all of my friends at Los Cien, to all of the candidates and the Latino community at large, that I apologize and I'm sorry for having to cancel the event uh, at Sally Tomatoes. Uh, you have my support. Um, canceling the event goes against every bone in my body, and the decision was not made easily. Uh, it was made uh, due to uh, wanting to protect my staff, my family, and my business partner um, uh, from potential issues that were going to occur. And I just want to say that I hope to be able to partner with you uh, in the future. And uh, I wish you all the best of luck. And thank you once again. My commitment to LOCN is, is, uh, is firm, and I wish you all well. Thank you very much, Gerard. As some of you may know, one of our leaders and mentors, or Herman J. Hernandez, is not able to be with us this evening because of health troubles. Herman, it's like familia to so many of us. We send thoughts, prayers, and good vibes to him and his family tonight. Salute, Herman. Now, I'm really happy to introduce our moderator for this evening, Pat McDonald. Pat is a housing attorney and the co-chair of Los Cien Program Committee. Welcome, Pat. The floor is yours. Thank you, Fernando. Before we begin, I want to acknowledge that today is Cesar Chavez Day. Nelo Cien is proud to continue a long tradition of Latinx and Chicano empowerment right here in Sonoma County. We are disappointed we could not be in person for this event um, and are very grateful to Gerard and to Sally Tomatoes for their partnership. Los Cien values the health and the safety of our community and our decision to require vaccination to attend in person was in the interest of the health and safety of attendees. And our subsequent decision to move online was for the health and safety of our partners who are being unfairly targeted and harassed. LOCIEN exists to hold critical conversations on issues that concern the Latinx community and to uplift and illuminate Latinx experiences. Our intention is to build bridges towards solutions and change that empower every community member. We respect all perspectives and we expect respect and professionalism in return. We are committed to holding these difficult conversations and Lucien will not be stopped in doing so because what affects the Latinx community affects everyone who calls Sonoma County home. So here's the structure for this evening, a select group of LOCIEN members has written initial questions for the candidates. But audience members who are joining us, you are invited to write and to share your own questions with us through the chat and the Q&A portal. And there will be LOCIEN members who are looking at those questions, collecting them and sending them to me to ask to the candidates. I will ask each of our candidates the same questions, alternating the order between candidates and between districts. I will announce the time for each question and the order in which the candidates will respond before asking the question. And Fernando will help keep time and alert the candidates as their time winds down. So candidates, make sure that you can see Fernando when you're answering. Each candidate at the end of our program will have one minute for a closing statement. 
And now it's my honor to turn to our candidates themselves for the second and fourth supervisorial districts for Sonoma County. For District 2, we are joined by Kevin Hayenga, Blake Cooper, and Supervisor David Rabbit. And for District 4, Supervisor James Gore and Andy Springer are here with us. By way of brief introductions from District 2, Kevin Hayenga is a film editor and documentary filmmaker from Petaluma. He grew up in Petaluma, has worked for a variety of networks and studios, including CBS News, ABC News, and HBO Max Latino. Blake Hooper is a legislative aide for the California State Senate. He grew up in Petaluma and has worked at multiple levels of government and local community organizations. And he serves on Petaluma's planning commission. David Rabbit is the incumbent supervisor for District 2. David is a longtime Petaluma resident, a former Petaluma City Council member, and a uh, professional architect. From District 4, James Gore was born and raised in Northern Sonoma County and is fluent in Spanish. James led the fourth district for the past eight years, during which time James and his wife have raised their two children along the Russian River near Healdsburg. And finally, Andy Springer is a local business owner who has lived in Sonoma County since 2005. And he has been a community leader and founder of local businesses and nonprofit organizations for that entire time. Lucien sincerely thanks all of our candidates and all of our audience members too for each of you being here with us tonight. And so now we'll finally get to the questions for our panel. Candidates, we're hoping to better understand in practical terms how each of you would differ in addressing the key issues that confront Sonoma County. Our first question, each candidate will have 90 seconds to answer, and the order will be as follows. Mr. Hooper will go first, followed by Supervisor Rabbit, and then Mr. Hyenga. Then we will shift to the District 4 candidates. Supervisor Gore will go, and then we will finish with Mr. Springer. So with Mr. Hooper going first, the question is as follows. Please describe your commitment to and involvement with diversity, equity, and inclusion. And please share both the how and the why of this work from your personal perspective and your perspective as a candidate. Mr. Hooper, you have 90 seconds. Thank you very much. And I first wanna begin by giving my thoughts and prayers and my family's thoughts and prayers out to Herman Hernandez Sr. and the rest of his family. I know they're going through a lot right now. In terms of how I would address the issues of diversity and inclusion and how we respond to them and why, for my whole public service career, I've been engaged in making sure that people are able to make a better lives for themselves by getting to the next step in the process that they're working through. A lot of people in my district and especially in this county have been struggling for quite some time to be able to build a life here for well over a decade now. When it comes to equity, when it comes to inclusion, this county is just not prepared for the percentages that we are facing in terms of what makes up our population. Over a quarter of our population is Latina and Latino, and it's even more when you consider the inclusion of every community of color that we have in this county. And at, current, at our current processes as a county, we tend to address these issues in a silo loud, rather than working together. As a legislative aide, I do a great deal of work in housing and wildfire recovery policy. I focus a lot in terms of how communities can come together to work together, especially those that are left out because of language justice. As a, as a field representative and caseworker, I've done a lot to work with the most vulnerable in our community, especially those that have been unable to be included in the processes that have helped determine people's lives and how they will do well in the future. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Hooper. Next up, we'll have Supervisor Rabbit. You have 90 seconds. You know, thank you very much. And again, my heart uh, goes out to Herman uh, as well, my good friend Herman. You know, my personal perspective and the perspective as a candidate are really one and the same. Uh, I'm a child of immigrants. My mother and father were economic immigrants. They came to America to make a better life for themselves with $40 in their pocket combined. Um, through New in New York, my mom was a maid. My father was a laborer. They truly uh, were looking for that experience uh, to live the American dream. And I am acutely aware that their experience was eased by the fact that uh, they're white 
and they spoke English. But I still see my father and the courage it takes to leave home and to build a better life in all immigrants. And really my work at the county is driven by that same desire and to ensure that life is better for the next generation. Uh, we can only do that when everyone in our community is able to live in full equality, free from discrimination or the systematic injustices rooted deeply in our society. Um, this is really personal to me in terms of uh, my parents' journey, that idea that that next generation is going to be better off than the last, that we make sure that we keep in making those investments, not only in our society, but our infrastructure and our government, so that they do have all the opportunities, more opportunities, in fact, than their parents had before them. Thank you, Supervisor Rabbit. Uh, Kevin, Mr. Hyenga, you are up next and you have 90 seconds. Uh, thank you for letting me be a part of this debate. Um, my grandparents were from Italy. My grandfather moved to Argentina when he was 12 and he was a pescador moving up to Brazil before he became a steel mill worker. Um, I felt the discrimination from uh, my own family. Uh, the Hyenga family is a very white family and they would do a lot of things like, I would get the, um, the discrimination that, where they would be giving you the heels of the bread as a kid. They wouldn't let you drink any more orange juice. And then my grandmother, she finally, my white grandmother finally came down and visited us. And we brought her to us a little gazebo that we used to love. And she basically said, you know, your problem with me all your life is you're half a Dago and you're always gonna be half a Dago. My um, Italian mother got really upset with that. And um, that was the last time I saw my grandmother. Um, but the grandmother, my very white grandmother would keep uh, sending letters. She would send a letter every Christmas talking about all the gifts that she would give her grandchildren, her a bicycle this, a typewriter to another grandchild. And she would write this huge letter every Christmas and then she would leave us a dollar. Um, also, I felt discrimination when I was in my 20s. I was mistaken as a Latino. I used to work for, you know, tell, I work in television and we work long hours and I used to really like the outdoors. So I used to go, go hiking. But one time I went hiking, I fell asleep. I was then attacked by an officer with a badge, started attacking me. He said, get up, get up, get up. Thank said, you, oh, Mr. Hyenga. Oh, is it it? That's the end of your time. Oh, yeah. no, that's so short. <laughs> Keep okay. an eye on, on Fernando. He's holding up. Oh, I didn't see him. Parts. Sorry about that. Anyways, I've always been a part. Of... So, yeah, yeah, go for it. Supervisor, Supervisor Gore, you're up and you have 90 seconds. Yeah, thank you, Pat, and uh, thank you to everybody. Muchas gracias a todos ustedes que están aquí con nosotros. Es un placer, como siempre, luchar con ustedes en este tiempo de, de caos. Um, my name is James Gore. You know, my life has really been about uh, working hard to not just make the world a better place as a concept, but as a reality. And if I think about the words diversity, equity, inclusion, and really think about the Latinx population here in our community, think about the Eritrean community, think about the work that I've done with the five federally recognized tribes here in the community. Um, it's all about doing what's right. That's what government's all about. And uh, if you're focused on really what the equity conversation is, it's not equality. It's not trying to say we're gonna spread everything thin for everybody. It's saying that what we're gonna do is use limited resources to try and help those out who are the least fortunate. Now, that also takes responsibility and accountability, but that's how it really needs to be done. Um, in the days following our fires in 2017, uh, found myself in this crazy position of uh, being a translator, being somebody who was standing for uh, uh, before an entire community and uh, using my Spanish that I had learned as a Peace Corps volunteer in Bolivia and uh, here in the fields in Sonoma County and working hard, working on it, just leaning in, trying to make sure that information was available. That's the first step, you know, but onward from that, we did that a few times, we rallied and then we got into this pandemic and uh, really, uh, things went different. And so we created the Office of Equity, which I champion. And uh, pleasure to be with you guys and looking forward to the next questions. Thank you, Supervisor Gore. Uh, Mr. Springer, you're gonna close us out on this question and you have 90 seconds. Okay, thank you very much for allowing me to be here and all the hard work that you and your team did. And Gerard, I'm sorry so much for what happened to you and your business. 
so grateful for your willingness to support us and all that we're trying to do in the community. Let me just say this, um, the best thing I think that we could do, especially as a government, is to stay out of your way. The American dream is not dead, it's well alive. And frankly, a lot of people are living in Sonoma County wishing they could have more of it. And I'm just gonna say to, to our audience, the best thing you could do is not allow for people to stand in your way of your dream. You go around them, you do whatever is necessary to accomplish what you need to do, but don't wait for somebody else to make it happen for you because they're not going to. You can tell from your communities as they are right now, the things that are going on right now as we shuffle homeless people around our community, where are these homeless people winding up when our people are being moving them around? They're not happening. They're not landing in areas where, where other people are living. They're landing where you live. And the bottom line is we've got to have a safe community. We've got to have a communication community. We've got to have a community that cares about one another, steps out on behalf of one another. And I'll say this to you. If you're listening and you're a young Latino, if you're a young immigrant, if you're a young, young person who's a family of immigrants, step up, take a spot, pick a school board, pick a, pick a whatever spot you want and start leading. And let's get this future for you the way it goes for everybody. Let's get it. Let's, there's dreams out there. Let's grab them. Thank you, Mr. Springer. So we're going to move now to our second question. Each candidate is going to have two minutes to respond to this question. And the order is going to be as follows. Uh, Mr. Springer, you're going to be up first. We're going to have District 4 up first with Mr. Springer, then Supervisor Gore. Then for District 2, we'll first have Supervisor Rabbit, Mr. Hyenga, and finally, Mr. Hooper. And I may interject on this one to keep folks on topic because I think we have an important one here that we want direct answers to. Question is this, several high profile county officials have recently left, citing a pattern of racial bias and microaggressions that makes working for the county untenable for people of color. For incumbent supervisors, how aware were you of these concerns and what specifically have you done to change things since being made aware? And for challengers, what is the first thing you would do if elected to address these issues in all county departments? Mr. Springer, you're up first and you have two minutes. I don't think discrimination and racism is um, appropriate. And every person that's borrowing breath from heaven that lives in this beautiful place has every right to go to work without that kind of feeling. And the bottom line is if it's ever showing up, you need to speak up and the department head needs to handle it. And frankly, if it's not being handled appropriately, then you need to do something above that person. But you should never put up with bullying. You should never put up with discrimination. You should never put up with that kind of behavior. I don't know where you are, workplace or not, government or not, you should not allow for that. And the people that are watching that aren't experiencing that, that witness it, need to step up and say something. It needs to stop, it's not okay. Mr. Springer, if I may just follow up on that, because if elected, you will be part of the head of the county apparatus and many of the employment decisions, how would you specifically institute policies that would prevent racism and microaggressions experienced by people of color? I, I honestly believe, Pat, there's already uh, things in place um, and maybe there needs to be more reinforcement or more enforcement of it. And then if there are other things that need to happen to make it a more appropriate environment, then I think we need to make those things happen. Thank you, Mr. Springer. Uh, Supervisor Gore, um, you have two minutes. You know, culture change is real and the difficulty of, uh, of, of invoking that in a way that really is inclusive takes time and it's, uh, and it's hard work and it's a mess and you have to embrace it. It gets harder the, you, the, the, the further you get into it. So speaking specifically to these, uh, these two individuals, our former department heads, the first thing I wanna do is I, I say this sincerely as partners with them is, is that I wanna thank them for their service. Um, the point that come up most recently with the one where uh, our director of the Economic Development Board left, there was a lot of citing of microaggressions and other things. And that was really focused, not just on what was going on in the county, but also in the community. It was the marginalization of an individual um, walking into a room and, uh, and being left out when they were asked by us to also be a change maker. And that's really the key here is, is that us as a board of supervisors, we've acknowledged and I acknowledge that I'm a white guy, even if I speak Spanish, even if I speak Italian, I am a white guy and I see the world differently than a lot of other people. And my goal has to be to provide support to individuals who are marginalized. I've learned my lessons. 
I sit there with, uh, with Shiva person Whitley and, uh, and work through these issues as much as possible and be the biggest ally that I can with Barbie Robinson and now with our new director of health uh, and, and also our director of the Office of Equity, Alegria de la Cruz. These are tough issues. These are individuals who are being attacked each and every day. Um, and they're being attacked just for being different and bringing different voices to the table. Uh, we have hired these individuals because we want to invoke change and culture change in our organization. The training we do, uh, the work with core groups, the work we're doing on getting community advisory councils up to date is all about driving progress. One of the main reasons that we are having issues is because we are in the game and we are embracing the mess of culture change. Committed to lean in, committed to seeing it through, committed to making it right. Thank you, Supervisor Gore. Supervisor Rabbit, you will be the first from District 2 to respond to this question. You have two minutes. And I love serving with uh, Supervisor Gore with that type of uh, approach. It's, uh, it's very beneficial. But I think uh, the big picture here, this points to the work in which we all share, uh, not just within the county as an institution, as, uh, as James mentioned, but within the entire community. Uh, you know, much was reported about what was happening within the county itself, but this is really about in the broader community. Those microaggressions, those biases, they, they occur throughout the county. This is our work together to make sure that we can continue uh, to make this place a better, a better place. A racial slur in school, a Zoom bombing incident, for instance, uh, were out there. You know, personally, I had a great working relationship with our, take for our former health services director, for instance, like James said, a strong black woman who was brought in to make change, uh, clean up some lingering issues, and uh, really within the department, and she excelled at her job, um, that she or anyone else who worked for the county experienced bias or microaggressions is just simply unacceptable, full stop. Uh, I didn't know about the work, workplace experiences. She did confide in me uh, when she made the decision to move on and I supported her and I, in her transition to her new position in Texas. You know, after her departure, I think what's important in the county is that the pattern of that workplace bias and microaggressions, when that came to light, we brought in a, I believe, a, a great consultant who spoke with the board regarding microaggressions and active listening. Uh, again, like James mentioned, you know, learning as we go, adapting and making sure that we're always constantly improving is something I think we're all committed to. Um, the Office of Equity, the core team, another thing to embed equity as a foundational element within the county and all that we do. I think you're seeing that uh, over and over in this, uh, particularly as a result of the actions that took place uh, within the county, in and around the county. Um, doing the work, listening. Uh, learning and ensuring that everyone can show up to work authentically free from any form of discrimination is, the, is what we want. Thank you, Supervisor Rabbit. Um, Mr. Hyenga, you're up next. Um, you have two minutes, and if at any point um, anyone needs me to repeat the question, I'm more than happy to do so. But Mr. Hyenga, um, your time is starting. Well, discrimination is wrong. I've always fought. I'm the one of the guy who speak up. Um, when I was talking about the police getting, you know, talking to me, talking me down, thinking I was Latino, saying, you know, K, I was saying OK, and he thought I was saying K and what, and he had an apathy of racial stuff. I went to the assistant director, to assistant DA and the DA and got that guy out of law enforcement. Um, I stood in front of uh, in Australia during Aborigines. When Aborigines were being rounded up, I stopped the police doing that. What well, I don't know about a specific policy, but I would be there to you know speak up against discrimination. I think it's wrong. I'm still getting um, racial attacks because I talk about a bio of my experience with Latinas and Latinos. I'm still trying to stop all the racial attacks. Um, it's wrong. Um, I would step up. I would use the cloud of my office to you know, stop such attacks and stop such discrimination, allow people to feel comfortable working wherever they are working. Um, it's, that it, it, just strikes, it, strike, it strikes me so much that I, to hear that, that discrimination is happening in the county, uh, county office level. I did not know that. Um, I would be there for you. Uh, that's the best I can say at this point, but it's just wrong. And I wish people would just you know, get over this and move on to the 21st century. Thank you, Mr. Hyenga. Um, 
Mr. Hooper, you are going to close us out on this question. You have two minutes. Patrick, would you please repeat the question? Yes. So for you being a challenger, um, the question is, what is the first thing you would do if elected to address the issues of racism and microaggressions that have led to the departure of people of color from county leadership? Thank you. And I'd just like to start off by saying that this is a prime example about how much of our county leadership has been culturally incompetent as far as these responses have gone. These are only tough issues if leadership at the head does not set a clear tone and agenda for how county administration and departments will move forward. If I were, if I were elected, the first thing I would focus on is making sure that we have full public hearings to review our HR policy and our no tolerance policy. I would want a full review on how incident reporting has gone, how our responses have worked and what resolutions we've come forward with. I would wanna make sure that we have full and regular trainings put in place, and I would want to see us follow through with a variety of trainings moving on a monthly to quarterly basis, because when it comes to equity, when it comes to microaggressions, there's really never enough training to make sure that you are evolving. That's certainly true for an entire staff. I would also want to make sure that we give the Department of Equity the budget it actually needs and the authority it should have had in the first place. The Department of Equity doesn't have enough teeth. Most more often than not is giving recommendations, but that to put all of that work, all of that policy, all of that focus in one department and silo it off is reprehensible. And it says it sets a horrible precedent moving forward if you're trying to take equity seriously. And I would just like to say that having a session with a consultant on this is not actually moving forward on the policy. This is work that's going to take well over a year, probably a full term just to get right based on the history that we have had in this county. And please do not tell me that you've had two department heads leave and you are not aware of the issues that they are facing. I would hope that our supervisors would understand the conditions that their employees are facing. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Hooper. So we're moving on to our third question. This will be a question for which each candidate will have 90 seconds to answer. And the order will be as follows. We'll start with District 2. Going first will be Mr. Hyenga, then Mr. Hooper, and finally Supervisor Rabbit. Then to District 4, Supervisor Gore will go first, and we will close out the question with Mr. Springer. So Mr. Hyenga, you will be going first, and the question is this. For many months, local ordinances have protected tenants from eviction unless one of three narrow criteria is met. The tenant is an imminent threat to health or safety, the landlord intends to immediately remove the property from the rental market, or the tenant has failed to pay rent for reasons other than pandemic-related financial distress. According to the Press Democrat, these and other protections have cut local eviction filings to one-third of 2019 or pre-pandemic levels. But frustrated landlords want broader ability to remove landlords want broader ability to remove tenants. If elected, would you extend or rescind these tenant protections? And if you would extend them, for how long would you keep them in place? Mr. Hyenga, you have 90 seconds. Well, I will definitely extend them. I mean, they're, it's ending today, right? The 31st, a lot of their rental stuff. Um, I would definitely extend them. I would uh, extend, it would probably be more on a person to person basis. I mean, even I was um, affected by the economic shutdown and I'm still recovering from it. So, um, I would definitely extend it for at least another six months, you know, get us into the winter. And it would be on a case by case basis, making sure, you know, people are not taking advantage of it. Mr. Hyanga, could you explain for what you mean by a case by case basis? Well, I, I have, I, I'm always I'm aware about people having fraud in there. I've just been reading reports about how many people took money from the COVID um, relief fund when they really didn't need it and they bought Lamborghinis and all that kind of stuff. So when I would think about case by case, I would definitely still want to look at, you know, making sure they are legit, they need the money. And know, just for clarification, Mr. Hanga, could yeah. you explain how you would do that through a county ordinance? How would I do it through a county order, or, ordinance? Well, we would have to work with the states and the federal to e extend a lot of that money. Um, and I would have to work with the cities on the evictions and all that kind of stuff. So. I'm not sure how specifically I would do at this point, but I would definitely be a support in extending the, the eviction, you know, extending from not having been evicted. 
I'm having allergies. <coughs> Excuse me. <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Hyenga. Uh, next up, we will have Mr. Um, Mr. Hooper from District Two. You have 90 seconds. Thank you. Yes, I would extend the current eviction protections, and I would probably extend them for close to another two years if possible. The reasoning behind this is that if you think about this in, in the same frame as the byproduct of or the aftermath of a wildfire, it takes close to two years to rebuild a home. You think about the impact of this pandemic, a pandemic which I might add is still very much going on. You've got businesses that have been severely impacted, people have lost their homes, lost their jobs, or family members that are struggling. That's a long-term impact that is going to have to be dealt with. And if we don't want to see our community lose some of its most uh, focus and dedicated members, we really have to do the work to make sure that we have valid protections. Also, in the long term, this is why I would want to see the county support just cause a, a full just cause eviction ordinance in order to make sure that we don't have to do this every time there's a crisis because we are prepared when people are struggling. Thank you. So Mr. Cooper, or Hooper, if I may follow up on that real quick, you're suggesting that you would want a permanent just cause ordinance. Yes, I would. To protect tenants. Is that what I understand? I would want to extend in the short term, and then I would want to make sure that we bring cities together as partners to really look at what that ordinance could look like, and also make sure that we bring in all, all the partners involved. I wouldn't want to make this a blanket dictation. I would want to make sure that we come out of this with a shared support for our renters. Thank you. Understood. Thank you, Mr. Hooper. Uh, finally, from District 2, we will have Supervisor Rabbit. You have 90 seconds. Apologize for to do that tonight. I would extend it as well. The first, uh, you know, uh, renters are still hurting. People that were uh, disproportionately impacted by the pandemic are still financially hurting, obviously. Uh, so I would extend it. You know, ours is on the books, uh, is still on the books today. Um, a two-year extension, I believe, uh, you know, on top of what we've had in place um, since really 2017, with wildfires, uh, we really need to make sure that we work with our landlords out there as well, uh, because the end result might not be to have any rental housing stock or losing housing stock uh, countywide, uh, which has been a problem uh, for this county, really. So uh, when the state emergency order expires, uh, as, well as, as well ours, uh, the board, I think, is very open to uh, enacting that uh, going forward. So I would extend it. Um, but I would make sure that we work with everyone as we do it and not just set an arbitrary date, but really be more strategic. Thank you, Supervisor Rabbit. Um, moving over to District 4, uh, Supervisor Gore, you're up first. You have 90 seconds. Yeah, thank you. I think there's two things is what is it and how long do you extend it? And this is relevant because at our last board meeting last week, this came up and we got a presentation from county staff that went in and said, Basically that what we have on the books, number one, is there are certain things that are expiring at the state level here on April 1st. We still have ours on the books, but ultimately June 30th is when the emergency order from the state ultimately expires and we have to decide in that time period earlier rather than later is what we want to protect and how long we want to protect it. So I wanna be very clear is, is that what we passed was in the pandemic and it was uh, brought to us in a place where it was a virtual meeting and we were responding rapidly. And I want to say that in some parts, it's, it's based and really tied to what the state is. So we got to decide what we keep in terms of just cause eviction and what are the exemptions outside of that that allow you to be able to uh, basically move somebody if they don't meet, if, if they fall within that exemption category. So for me, uh, the first thing is, is that we have to go back and take what was created as a mallet and go back and look at it as a scalpel. Um, I do have examples uh, throughout here and in conversations with Mayor Ro uh, Rogers and Santa Rosa and others of the need to basically not protect bad people who are staying in places and not taking care of what they're doing, but on the other side is make sure that we hold accountability and for those individuals who are trying to, to catch up with past paid rent is that we provide them not only legislative assistance, but also financial assistance. Thank you, Supervisor Gore. And finally, with this question, we have Mr. Springer. You have 90 seconds. Can you repeat the question for me, please? Certainly. So the question I explained the ordinances that have protected um, tenants throughout the pandemic. And the question was, if elected, would you extend or rescind these tenant protections? 
And if your intention would be to extend them, for how long would you keep them in place? Pat, I appreciate the question. I think this is going to show the difference between me and most of the people on the panel. I really believe strongly in uh, government staying out of our way. And I understand both sides of this argument. I have been evicted. I have been asked to leave because my wife was pregnant with my first baby. And the landlord at that time didn't want us in there because we were having, we had too many people now. So that was when I was a young 24 year old kid with a baby. And uh, we had to find a place to live. To be honest, I've been a landlord also because my next purchase was a house, a duplex. And in that duplex, I wound up um, putting two families in there. And my wife and I wound up moving out of the area and both of them, because of the law in Pennsylvania at the time, um, you couldn't remove those families in the winter time because they had children. And those people wind up, wound up costing me a ton of money and also um, made a mess of my house. So there's a lot to this issue, and I'm afraid that these blanket um, projects that we put in place, these situations, honestly are not looking closely enough at both sides of the coin. And a lot of people are hurting not only renters, but property owners, business owners. There's a lot of pain in the middle class, and those are just hovering above the poor line. And I'm frankly um, a little concerned that we continue to get in the way. And yes, I agree. Yeah, we should help folks that are hurting. The reality of it is we don't want to hurt more people in the process. Thank you, Mr. Springer. So we're moving on to our fourth question. Um, this is going to be uh, 90 seconds given to each candidate. And the order for this one, we will start with District 4, Supervisor Gore, and the Mr. Springer. Moving to District 2, Mr. Hooper will go first, and Mr. Hyenga, and Supervisor Rabbit will close. The question is this. We have frequent debates over the approval of large scale relative to Sonoma County housing developments. In a recent example is the Sonoma Developmental Center. In late January, the Press Democrat reported that during the January 26th Board of Supervisors hearing, Supervisor Gorin advocated reducing the proposed housing units for the center by almost 50% based on frequent concerns regarding infrastructure, fire safety, rural character, et cetera. In view of the ongoing housing shortage and affordability crises, does planning for 50% fewer housing units on the Sonoma Developmental Center site really make sense? And how do you plan to approach housing proposals that come up in your district? And I just realized with a question that complex, Fernando, how about we do two minutes on the clock for each candidate? Supervisor Gore, you're up and you have two minutes. Thank you. I think there's a couple of things here. You talk about Sonoma Developmental Center, and then let's talk about Sonoma County. You know, Sonoma County has nine incorporated cities and then the county, the unincorporated area. There's not a lot of places in the county still to build out a lot of housing units. You know, Sonoma Developmental Center is one. Uh, there's a workforce uh, housing overlay going on at the airport area. We have a redevelopment project, a spring specific plan for out there. Um, but, and then there's West County Little Hamlets, but you know, there's not a lot of build out potential in those areas. So Sonoma Developmental Center is definitely a key area and there should be housing there. There should be an ample amount of housing. And that's what ultimately we as a board uh, approved coming back to the EIR because it also has to be self-sufficient. That area has to have uh, you know, wildlife and protection. It has to have community, um, but then it also ultimately uh, has to pay for itself. That was the deal with the state. So we're gonna do follow-up meetings, that's gonna come back to us, but I do anticipate a large amount of housing. You talked about a thousand being, a thousand plus being offered earlier, Supervisor Gorin coming back and saying 500 to 700, kind of us coming around saying 700 to 800, but that's gonna be reviewed. And that should be based on the carrying capacity of the land. Uh, the other thing I'll say as we get into kind of other things countywide is that what you've seen from our board, from myself, uh, from a colleague here, from others, is that we have put historic money into affordable housing projects. Uh, to build those out. Uh, there is no way to fix housing overnight, especially when you live in a community where people are buying second homes hand over fist. Uh, you can continue to regulate like we have short-term rentals, vacation rentals appropriately, but you've got to invest in that housing and you've got to be able to have covenants into it so that individuals with 70% AMI, average median income up to 90 can afford to afford this stuff. So you've seen us approve every project, even though people come forward and say, I support affordable housing, but not here. And that happens on every single project. But you've seen us continue to lean in and approve projects. Thank you, Supervisor Gore. 
Uh, Mr. Springer, you're up next and you have two minutes. Thank you. Um, Housing is a major issue in our community. Um, really, to be honest with you, most of our middle class can't afford housing to buy a house, to rent a house. Uh, frankly, it's out of control. And many of the people I talk to in the streets of my district are worried about this situation. To be honest, there's a lot of conversation that needs to be had about, are we reaching capacity? Are we scalable? The reality, I'm wondering about the water issues. We're in a drought for the last decade. Where are we coming up with water? Where, where's that process gonna come from? We're, we're in trouble there. We've got a lot of work to do. If we're gonna start building houses, what are you gonna do to provide for them the necessary water? We got a lot of things going on that need to be addressed, but the reality of it is most of your middle-class workers cannot afford to live here. And there's high taxes that can be fixed. There's regulations that can be removed. There's, there's all kinds of permits that could be stopped. Uh, this bottom line is, you know, we're gonna put a stop on how many people can buy how many homes. Well, the reality of it is we won't even let them live in their homes without the pressure right now. So I think Pat, to be honest, one another thing, our government needs to stop trying to fix everything and let the people figure it out. And as far as the, the buildings go, all the things we're talking about, let's make sure we got a good 20 year plan before we start doing all this stuff. Because with that, what, what happens when your plans grow up? Are they gonna be worth keeping around? That's the biggest Thanks. question I have. Mr. Springer, if I could just ask for one point of clarification, because you mentioned both getting the government out of the way, but then yep. also the 20 year plans and water regulation. Could you please reconcile those two ideas for the folks who are in attendance? Yeah, so the problem with too much government, I think effective, efficient government is fantastic and worthwhile, but government's prior, priority pro, uh, purpose is for safety. And we're, we're not even paying our, our sheriffs, our police, our firefighters, our first responders enough to where they could purchase a home for the most part. Their average income isn't gonna provide the cost of a home in this area. So we got serious problems with safety, let alone the housing and all that stuff. So thank you, Pat, for letting me clarify. Thank you, Andy, or thank you, Mr. Springer. Uh, moving now to uh, District Two. Uh, first, we'll have Mr. Hooper stepping up. Thank you very much. And I'd like to say first, right out of the way, that I completely agree with Chair Gore. When it comes to the land that we have in Sonoma County, that is county land, there isn't much left that's ideal for development. If we're thinking about the drought, if we th we're thinking about agricultural land, if we're thinking about making sure that our housing is near the services that need to be there, near hospitals, schools, sources of food, it really doesn't make sense to develop, not to develop out our county that much further. However, we do have arena numbers from the state and we do have to address the significant housing crisis. This is why partnerships with our cities are gonna be so very important. And I, I know this is sincerely the same opinion of many of our city leaders because this is why I have so many of the endorsements of our current and former mayor and vice mayors of both Petaluma and Runner Park and so many council members in the district as well as the majority of mayors in the county. They are hungry for partners at the county who are willing to work with them when it comes to long-term and regional planning and infill city development. Yes, the county has the arena numbers it has to meet, but many of our cities are very open to looking at ways to get support from the county to do arena swaps, to have more development that is, that is transit oriented and focused around our 101 corridor. There are ways for us to do this that are also very important when it comes to making sure that we don't abuse our water sources any further and have a clear structure by which we can make sure that water going out is properly processed and put back into place. And the only way we're going to do that was, is with more city development. That is why I also want to make sure that our county, when developing out its next general plan, works in coordination with our cities to make sure we're not working at cross purposes, to make sure our climate mitigation plans match, and to make sure that for the next 20 years, we are thinking together and not in silos. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Hooper. Uh, I believe next up we have uh, Mr. Heining. Yeah, well, I agree with Hooper and I agree with Springler on the part that we do have a water shortage. You know, every time you build a new apartment or a new building, you're adding a lot more water and we're getting a lot less water in our rainy seasons. What we really need to do is work on the rents. Rents are too damn high. Rent control and fair rent practice need to be implemented. Too many people spout building low-income housing, which end up being too expensive for low-income families. They are using the phrase low-income to fast-track for-profit companies. 
I'm born and raised here. I've never seen an apartment go up and actually was affordable for low income. As Springer says, basically middle-class people could barely even afford that. If rent and utility is taking three quarters of your take-home pay, then it's not low income. We need to define exactly what low income housing is before we fast track projects that end up out of reach of low income folks. The average rent for an apartment in California is around $1,700. So apartments that are geared for low income families need to be drastically less than 1,700, near the thousand dollar mark. Otherwise it's really not for low income. Low income. It should have all the amenities such as a dishwasher and washer and dryer. And if the washer and dryer are not in the unit, then the laundry room that folks can use with a stipend or credit should be used for the washer and dryer. Too often folks are having to shell out a lot of money to do their laundry in these little tiny washing machines. Mr. Hyenga, if I, if I may, you are, as a legal aid attorney, uh, you are speaking my language, but the question is about the development of housing in county areas. And could you please provide some guidance on what your kind of decision-making process would be for projects in um, areas of county jurisdiction. Okay, well, let me just continue with what I was saying. <laughs> um, and also for ample parking near mass transit. Um, as supervisor, I will define low-income housing. Um, as you're talking about for the county and spread, you really have to talk about the water needs for these new housings. Um, I would definitely, I would more go in gear in terms of applying rent control with the cities and fair rent practices. Today Thank you, affordable. Mr. Hyenga. Okay. We're moving on to Supervisor Rabbit, who is going to close this question. Uh, Supervisor Rabbit, you have two minutes. You yeah, know, thank you very much. Just real quickly on SDC itself. Uh, Supervisor Gore is correct. Uh, at the end of the day, the environmental document will determine the exact number or the range of homes that should be built there. It will be uh, more than uh, I think the cut that was mentioned by one of our other colleagues, only because the state emphasizes housing on surplus land. With that said, and I will say this, uh, you know, we we have nine incorporated cities, all of them have urban growth boundaries, uh, green belts around, and we tax ourselves to make sure that we had ci city centered growth but yet we have cities who still have vacant land in the middle of their town. That's what we need to work on. Here in Petaluma, you have two bare blocks right next to the smart station. And you have another bare piece of land on Corona and uh, McDowell that is destined for another smart station. If, it, if the projects are approved, there was an opportunity to approve both projects that resulted in more than 24% affordable housing, but yet it was denied. So that's a problem. The other problem I can tell you as an architect is there are jurisdictions that work to actually get housing built and there are jurisdictions who make it more difficult, more expensive, more lengthy. We need to be on the side of getting that housing built. These are for families, families like my son, the firefighter who can't afford to live in the county that he grew up in. Uh, these are significant problems. And I know that there's a lot of people struggling monthly uh, on housing costs, not being able to get into the market. Um, it, it's really, what is a development impact fee cost? I dare anyone to look it up and try to find out what a city charges you. It is like trying to decipher uh, some sort of strange code. And I say that as an architect. And why are they charging you that, that much money? Because a Prop 13 took away a revenue source and they just get it off of uh, the developers. The next ones in have to pay for all the infrastructure that haven't been budgeted over the course of time. That's a problem that we need to solve the housing crisis by coming and really talking honestly about it. Thank you, Supervisor Rabbit. Moving on to our fifth question. This will be a question for which each candidate will have just one minute, uh, but it's a simple one. Uh, we're gonna go in the order of Supervisor Rabbit. You're gonna be the first to speak, uh, then Mr. Hooper, Mr. Hyenga, moving to the fourth district, we'll have Mr. Springer, and then finish with Supervisor Gore. Uh, Supervisor Rabbit, in one minute, the move of county offices to downtown Santa Rosa remains under consideration. If the vote were held tomorrow, would you vote for or against the move? Uh, well, that's easy for me because I've been consistently opposed uh, to the move. Not because we don't need new county offices, we do. And actually I was the chair when we kept that deferred maintenance fund. We started the deferred maintenance fund to put money aside to do something about our county complex center. The truth of the matter is the county is fortunate to not have too much long-term debt. And really the proposal to buy the Sears department store, demolish the building and build a mid to high rise office building for a new county government center is just more too rich for our blood. 
at the end of the day, if you add in the financing costs that you're paying the developer, the guaranteed 10% return on investment annually, and all of the developer's fees, you're looking at about a 20% financing over the course of 30 years. So what was a, a building that should cost you about $600 per square feet is costing you about $1,200 per square feet, 1.3 billion over 30 years time, 46 million at a minimum per year that we can't afford. Thank you, Supervisor Rabbit. Mr. Hooper, in one minute, would you vote to move the county offices to downtown Santa Rosa? Yes, I'll try to be quick about this. That was some interesting math. So the current county plot complex is in a terrible location when it comes to services and direct transit to get to where people are going. The current, current county complex is also falling apart and the county will need to do something one way or another and retrofitting the current county complex will cost a fortune. When it comes to the new location, any type of movement for construction past the downtown Santa Rosa immediately increases cost for movement of materials, which is something that needs to be considered when looking at this decision. And as for the current location, you would have had federal funds and state funding because of transit oriented dollars. You would have had a developer that was willing to provide a fixed financing plan for 30 years. That's something rare that most communities wouldn't be able to accept. And you would have had long-term support from the city of Santa Rosa. So yes, I would have supported this because this would have saved us money. And where we are now is gonna end up costing us a fortune and put us in a constant cycle to figure out how to address our failing county complex. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Hooper. And finally, from district two, we have Mr. Hyenga. You have one minute. I would probably vote against it. Um, I think moving to the downtown area is just asking for more expense. Um, I understand the mass transit thing is not good in the, the county where it is right now, but I think it'd just be too expensive to move it to a downtown location. That's, so I would vote against it. Thank you, Mr. Hyanga. And we're moving to district four now. We'll have Mr. Springer first. You have one minute. Pat, honestly, the fact that we're having a conversation like this about a Sears project to nowhere that was going to cost us $55 billion for 30 years on top of itself. David Rabbit, Supervisor Rabbit, I thank God you were there to say no. You were the only one on the board that did. My, I'll just tell you, with so many people in our area suffering so, poor, so badly, hovering above the poor line, barely making it every day, us talking about building these ivory towers is a ridiculous concept. Let me say this, COVID taught us something. We can work from home and more than half of our employees in the county are willing to work from home. I also appreciate what you did, Supervisor Rabbit in Petaluma, getting some services into your town. There's a need for those things as well. We could focus our attention on getting some more resources to outer areas of our county rather than focusing on big, building a tower to nowhere so that we can work together in an already condensed area. Thank you, Mr. Springer. Um, we're gonna move to Supervisor Gore, but I've been asked to remind all of the candidates and there's a perverse incentive here, I understand it, that even though I have you under a time limit to also do your best to speak slowly and clearly because we do have folks listening to the Spanish translation channel. Um, with that, Supervisor Gore on the movement of county offices, you have one. You know, from the beginning, I've been supportive of us looking at downtown, but I've also been supportive of us rebuilding on our area because we have full entitlement, full parking, and we have all things led up for us to be able to have permitting too. So when we looked at downtown, Supervisor Rabbit and Supervisor Corsi went on this ad hoc and they went to look at it. What really happened was, is the Sears building jettisoned it into a fast track. And so when we brought it back, the thing I'll agree with my colleague on, uh, Supervisor Rabbit, is, is that we hadn't even discussed the financing plan. There's no way in hell that I was interested in spending 40 to $50 million a year uh, to go towards that. What was on our agenda, contrary to popular belief, was an option to buy the Sears building site to see if we could get that low interest rate loans to be able to make it pencil out. That's how the job works as a supervisor. You have to let staff come forward with plans. You can't jump all over the place and get excited or not. And you gotta sit there and review it and see if it makes sense. In this case, it didn't. I'm looking forward to looking at satellite offices and something back on our campus. Thank you, Supervisor Gore. Moving on to question number six. Um, each candidate will have 90 seconds 
to answer this question. And we will go with uh, District 4 first. Mr. Springer, you will be the first to answer, then Supervisor Gore. District 2 will be Mr. Hyenga, Supervisor Rabbit, and then finally, Mr. Cooper. Uh, so Mr. Springer, you'll have, um, did I say 90 seconds or two minutes? Pardon me. I said 90 seconds. Uh, 90 seconds to this question. Being in government is a job, but it's a public facing one. And that creates visibility on certain matters that for others might remain private. To what degree should public officials be held accountable for their lives, their opinions, and their actions outside of their work in county government? And what commitments can you give to voters for your own accountability? Mr. Springer, you have 90 seconds. So um, Pat, I'll be honest with you. Um, I think we need a whole lot more of what you're asking for. And uh, we need a lot less cover up from local press and others. Uh, my campaign has excited the conversation throughout our county. And I've gotten two articles written by the Press Democrat and neither one of them were nice. Neither one of them were approving. Neither one of them were kind. They've attacked my faith. They've attacked my personal choices medically that I've gotten professional help with. And they attacked me personally, privately with my own personal finances and made it seem to be though I was, I was in some kind of trouble. The reality of it is, I think if they did an inspection on everyone on this panel, like they've tried to do to me the last couple of weeks and make them take a look at their finances and their activities, I think it'd be interesting to find out what people are involved in, what votes are being passed that are benefiting family and friends. I think it'd be interesting to find out what's going on when people start paying attention. I don't have anything going on that I'm too concerned about. So I'll tell you this, you can, I'm an open book. You can check me out, do whatever you want. And I would be all for that for anyone that's going to serve us because we need honesty and integrity, transparency, and obviously we need great leadership. Thank you, Mr. Springer. Moving to Supervisor Gore, you have 90 seconds. You know, this isn't a, uh, this isn't a random idea. This is a reality. You know, we file forms every week, uh, every year we go through it. Uh, you know, there was something in the newspaper today that said that I had a uh, hundred dollars for uh, for filings on my wife's finances, and I had some people who were like, you know, you you work your butt off to make sure that all it is is that it's open, it's free, it's transparent in what you do. If you do this job, if you have the audacity to run for office, you need to expect that everything's going to be looked at. You're going to have to stand there basically naked before your community, and have to pass the test. That's what it is. Um, I do it every day. I, you know, I have people accuse me of highs and lows, but the reality is, is that I feel that this is a calling. And with that calling comes a huge level of responsibility in how I manage my life. It means it, it, it determines who I accept donations from. It determines uh, like, like how I look at, at ordinances when they come up and how I'm going to go after them. You know, like, like I'm not going to jump on red meat tonight. There have been articles written about all of us in different areas. You know, everybody has a right to go into how they're gonna to respond to that and what the people wanna know, you know, but I will just say that everything that you've ever seen out of me is transparency and everything you ever see going forward is gonna be transparency because it's a commitment. Uh, it's a way of life. It's not something you get to choose. So um, onward and upward. Thank you, Supervisor Gore. Uh, Mr. Hyenga, you will be the first of the district two candidates. Um, you have 90 seconds. Okay, I believe in transparency, um, especially on financial matters and any legal things that you've gone through. Family definitely should be kept separate. Um, I'm the only one on this panel who is not accepting donations. I'm the only one on this panel that's not spending thousands of dollars to run a campaign, build big signs, help with the land. So I'm an open book. I basically have no financial stuff to even to show you. So I do believe in transparency. I do believe you should be accounted for what you did in the past. Um, I don't know what's more. I believe in transparency. Thank you, Mr. Hyenga. Uh, Supervisor Rabbit on accountability for private affairs and private life. You have 90 seconds. Yeah, no, thank you very much. Uh, being in government, you are an open book. I think as my colleague mentioned, and rightfully, we should be held to a higher standard. It's about honesty, it's about integrity, it's about character. And I will tell you for me personally, it goes beyond just me and myself. I have three children and my wife who are ingrained in the community as well. Uh, this is important for me. You know, I am, 
I, I, I go to the market and I can't get out, uh, you know, any, any quick time. It, it's running into people. It, my cell phone is out there and people will call me, text me at, at any given time about an issue within the, within the community. Um, again, it's, it's, we are uh, public servants. Uh, the public deserves that uh, integrity, that character. Uh, and uh, I live up to that highest standard that we can. Thank you, Supervisor Rabbit. Finally, Mr. Hooper, you have 90 seconds. You know, as somebody who has worked for both the state and federal government, both as a caseworker, deeply ingrained in the community, and as a legislative aide, it is critically important that when it comes to whether you're an elected official or an employee, that you have clear transparency, especially around your finances, but also clear integrity of your purpose. I agree with Chair Gore that this is really a calling. And if you're going to do this, this takes up a lot of your, a lot of your life. My wife and I both work for Congressman Huffman. In that time, we had to travel up and down this district. And for a lot of the time, that meant that whether we were in the office or out of the office, we were thinking about the public and we were thinking about what we needed to do to make sure that they were being served appropriately. Now, when it comes to what this means for an elected official, especially a supervisor, because this is a full-time role, it really means that beyond just having transparency in your finances, beyond showing clear integrity in the actions you take in your private life, it's also about community engagement. In this district, we have not really had much engagement when it comes to someone like a supervisor. We don't have the community meetings. We don't have the town halls. We don't have the newsletters. More often than not, we wonder what is happening unless it's election season. So for me, part of that integrity means actually seeing somebody year round every year not just election year. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Hooper. And we're gonna to move to what I believe, just checking the time will be our final question. I can't guarantee you that, but um, we'll see how this goes. Uh, it'll be a 90 second question and the order is going to be district two first. Uh, we're gonna start um, with you, Mr. Hooper, then Supervisor Rabbit, Mr. Hyenga, moving over to district four, it'll be Supervisor Gore first, and then Mr. Springer. So 90 seconds, starting with Mr. Hooper. DEI efforts, it's diversity, equity, and inclusion, are a challenge for all parts of county government, but the sheriff's office has been particularly challenged. As supervisor, will you support robust, targeted efforts by the sheriff's office to recruit, hire, retain, and support sworn officers to reflect the diverse community of Sonoma County, and how? Mr. Hooper, you have 90 seconds. Yeah, yes, absolutely. And part of how we do that is by making sure that our county board of supervisors is firm in its belief and its support for accountability, not just in the budget, but also in what practices and policies are being followed by the sheriff's department. This is also why it is so important that we have a board that fully supports Iolero and that does not balk every time Iolero runs into a roadblock. It's also why it's important that we don't have elected officials that are endorsed and funded by the very uh, by the very sheriff's deputy association that is trying to pull at and remove our accountability. For us to have proper reform in the sheriff's department, for us to be able to know that these things are moving forward, we have to know that the sheriff's department also believes in accountability. And for us to actually support the effort you've just spoken about, that means we will have to show a clear, firm hand when it comes to that level of accountability and when it comes to the policy outcomes that we expect. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Hooper. And moving to Supervisor Rabbit, 97. Yeah, no, just real quickly. Yeah, it's about accountability, transpa transparency, and the rule of law. Um, I support efforts by the Sheriff's Office to make sure that we have an, uh, a force that actually reflects this county. This topic is not new. This is something that we've been talking about for quite a while and have made concerted efforts within the uh, Sheriff's Department to try to recruit in that direction. It is very difficult to hire. It's very difficult to hire right now anyone for any particular job, let alone for the public safety side of things. It doesn't mean that you don't double down the efforts and continue in that vein. Um, you know, For the record, I support Iliero. In fact, I am the one on the board that actually brought the budget item forward to add the additional staff needed uh, as Measure P was passed. Measure P did have some uh, legal issues that we knew about and were told at the time that it went on the ballot. And that's why it's not fully implemented at this particular point in time and our deputy sheriffs that are out there each and every day uh, protecting life and liberty uh, are doing a good job. Uh, doesn't mean that we don't need to have a continual improvement within the organization. And I think that uh, everyone knows that, everyone acknowledges that, and especially the assistant sheriff, Eddie Ingram. 
Thank you, Supervisor Rabbit. Mr. Hyenga, you are up next with 90 seconds. Okay, you know, I support a diverse law enforcement, a law enforcement that reflects the community. I support the Independent Office of Law Enforcement Review and Outreach, the IRL arrow that they keep saying. There should be accountability, you know, and I agree they shouldn't be balked at if they um, find a roadblock. Um, and the Sheriff's Department need to, um, uh, you know, cooperate with IRL arrow. Um, I believe in diversity and I would definitely um, support it in that way. <clears throat> Excuse me. Thank you, Mr. Hyanga. Shifting to uh, District 4, Supervisor Gore in 90 seconds. You know, the, the first part is yes, I support recruitment, hiring, retention, and making sure the workforce represents the community. And at the same time, I want to start by just thanking, and this isn't political, this is from a deep level, this is that the work that our public servants do, deputy sheriffs, firefighters, and others, we're in a five-year time warp. Uh, you know, from fires to floods to pandemic to everything under the sun. I've done ride-alongs, right, with our uh, deputy sheriffs. I've uh, been to the jail and seen our correctional deputies, and, uh, and I've seen the amazing work. And then at the same time, we've driven already towards a lot of the work that needs to be done to transform. Uh, Supervisor Rabbit and I used to have a colleague who every year during budget would bring up this issue of uh, how do we get a workforce that represents our community and also uh, not just on, on race, but also gender. And we have put money into recruitment and retention in the past two years to push that. We have worked with the sheriff's office to make sure that that is something that that is real. But at the same time, you got to pay people to do it. You got to get them in. The last time that the sheriff's office went out and did, uh, from my conversations with them, went out and did a wide broadcast of, uh, of review of uh, individuals out of like, uh, you know, 500 applications that came in, it was like 30 that were, that were qualified. We've made it so high to be able to be a public servant that we've made it difficult to even qualify and then we expect perfection out of all those applicants. So there's a lot of work that needs to be done. There's a lot that's been going on and uh, onward. Thank you, Supervisor Gore. And finally, Mr. Springer, you're gonna close out this. My life of service has taught me one thing, You've got to have people that understand other people in whatever service capacity they are in. And the bottom line is we've got to hire toward that. We've got to make sure that the people we hire are the kind of people that can communicate, can operate at a level that helps our community. I've got to say this again, it's so important. Government's primary job is safety. And when you, when you cut the budget of the share of $13 million the last two years, and you tell me that you're glad the guys are out there working and the current sheriff and the incoming sheriffs that I've interviewed with tell me that we don't have enough money to be able to put detectives out there to, to go after the folks that are doing crimes, drugs, gun enforcement, uh, sexual abuse, trafficking, all these things that are affecting the communities that you guys represent and talk about. I've got to tell you, I have questions about what we're doing to support our safety as a community. And our board is responsible for that. And they need to wake up to the fact that we're not doing the job of keeping our families, our business, and our people safe. And that, I think, is most important. Thank you. Mr. Springer, I just, since you have a little bit of time, I wondered if you would be able to connect that back to the diversity efforts in recruiting and training. Yeah, the bottom line is we've got to have the right people for the right communities. We've got to have the right kind of communication. We've got to have the right understanding. There's cultural issues. There are communication issues. There's all kinds of things that are happening in little blocks of our community that not everyone understands. And it's so important that we have people that understand what's happening in the neighborhood as they enter into that neighborhood so they can do what's necessary to keep that neighborhood safe. So yes, bottom line is we've got to have that kind of behavior or our communities are not going to be able to be safe like they need to be. Thank you, Mr. Springer. Um, I am going to try to do one more question, if that's okay with the candidates before closing statements. Is everyone okay? Okay. Uh, so this will be a quick one. We'll do 60 seconds uh, and we're going to go, Mr. Springer, we're going to stay with you, Supervisor Gore, then Mr. Hooper, Supervisor Rabbit, and finally, Mr. Hyenga. So in 60 seconds, how will you extend transit throughout the county to adequately service low-income people so that income will not be spent on gas and car repairs, but instead cover housing, rent, and other critical personal needs. Mr. Springer in 60 seconds. I think, Pat, the first thing that we could do is call upon our board to give us some tax relief. 
you know, the reality is there's taxes that are not necessary. Um, they're not needing it right now. They're, they're pretty flush. Um, they're talking about that all the time. Um, then give the money back to the people. And, um, you know, bottom line is there's transit issues all over our county that can be solved. We've got to focus on a lot of that stuff to help our people that are trying to buy into the American dream that can't even afford to put a gallon of gas in their tank. By the way, I have been there in 2009 when the downfall, downturn, I was barely able to put food on my table and be able to buy gas. So I totally get it. And the bottom line is people are living like that in the most affluent, most beautiful place in our world. And it's not okay. So I will do everything I can to help anyone trying to get where they need to go to supply for their family. Thank you, Mr. Springer. Shifting to Supervisor Gore on uh, transit, uh, you have 60 seconds. Yeah, thank you. In 60 seconds, I'll just start by saying that, uh, you know, the first thing that we've done is, is that we've made uh, the work of our transit, Sonoma County Transit, more affordable each and every year uh, for veterans, for uh, individuals who have uh, trouble making ends meet. And we just reviewed recently a fair fee transit pilot that I'm in support of, but it's just going to come back to our board. So that's the key first and foremost, is to get the individuals who are most, most burdened the opportunity to have those access points that get them to smart stations and other things like that. With respect to kind of the other points like coming up about like taxes and stuff, I mean, our taxes ebb and flow. The only taxes we get are really property taxes. So when you look at like how you want to use government money that comes in and where you want to put it towards, like it's, it's always a question of, of what is the biggest bang for your buck. And these days, you know, the tough thing is, is that we aren't in a walkable community except in, in, in green areas. So the key that we're trying to do is also invest in bike lanes and pedestrian access and other things that link to those areas. Thank you, uh, Supervisor Gore. Going to District 2, Mr. Cooper. You're <laughs> Thank you. Uh, a lot of this is going to go sincerely back to partnerships. Right now, we have a lot of potential uh, public transit tools that don't work well lined at all. We need our smart train to be the proper spine when it comes to mass tra transit in this region. We need our county, city, and regional buses to be working together to help feed that spine. We need smart to be expanded out further to actually have times and fares that make sense for working people that would actually make the train more successful. We also need to make sure that we are coordinating properly so that this can really work as a regional transit system. I've spoken with our mayors, our council members, I've spoken with our regional transit authorities. Many of them want this, but they've had a hard time coordinating because we don't have officials at the county level that really want to see this coordination take place. It took us over 20 years and taxing ourselves to get expanded, uh, expanded lane on Highway 101. We're not going to get a fourth lane, so we have to make regional transit work, and we don't have a lot of time to do it, especially if we're going to make, sorry, especially if we're going to make our regional climate goals. Apologies, it's a lot to say in 60 seconds. Thank you. Thank you, thank you for, thank you for your answer, uh, Mr. Hooper. Uh, Supervisor Rabbit, uh, 60 seconds is not much time, but on transit, if you can. Yeah, no, thank you very much. I could just tell you as an MTC commissioner, as a member of the Blue Ribbon Transit Recovery Task Force, I've been on this subject since day one, especially as it has gone through the pandemic. My committee alone at MTC has allocated $3.9 billion, billion with a B, to the 24 separate transit agencies within the Bay Area. We have too many transit agencies that we need to consolidate, even here in Sonoma County, and there has been a lot of work being done on that. I represent the Golden Gate Bridge, Sonoma County Transit. I know Petaluma City Bus, Santa Rosa City Bus, and I'm the chair of SMART. At SMART, we lowered the fees overall about 40% carrying that forward, and we did away with parking to make sure that we can bring people on board. Transit will always be about convenience. The, it'll have to be more convenient than staying in your car. It'll have to get you out of that car, and that's only gonna be by increased headways, routes, and costs. Um, it needs to be the transit of first choice, not last. Thank you, Supervisor Rabbit. Um, and finally, Mr. Hyenga, 60 seconds on transit expansion. Um, yeah, we do need to do more transit expansion. I would coordinate with the city and the county so that they actually work together because they don't really schedule very much well. Um, I would definitely put more money into mass transit. We, I grew up here and our mass transit was dismantled essentially. And we definitely need to, we're basically starting from scratch and trying to you know, mantle a mass transit with a smart train. Um, I would definitely put more funding to it because um, 
folks need it. And for the folks who are really struggling, they got to have a, even a cheaper um, fare for them as well. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Hyenga. And so now we're going to go to closing statements. Each candidate will have 60 seconds. We're going to start with Supervisor Gore, then go to Mr. Springer, Mr. Hyenga. You will lead off for District 2, Mr. Hooper, and then we will close with Supervisor Rabbit. So one minute closing statement, Supervisor Gore, whenever you're ready. You know, I'm here for one reason, it's to deliver results. I find this to be purpose-driven work and a calling. And, uh, and we have delivered results. In spite of these historic times, historic money into fire, historic money into water, historic money into roads, uh, investments in housing, solutions for homelessness. These aren't simple ideas. This is reality each and every day in the trenches. That's what local government's all about. And that's what representation is truly about here. Uh, the issue tonight around equity, you know, there's no greater thing to do than to stop focusing on the what and start focusing on the how and the who, and how we empower people to get into the workforce in the right ways, how we empower the right kind of flow and the kind of relationships between city and county. This is not about writing a plan in a vacuum and trying to get it to hit the ground in the community. This is about trench work every day. And that's what I've done with my team. That's why we're a we and not an I. So every time you see the name Gore, it's a we, it's us, it's a team, it's community engagement, it's working together. Thank you. Appreciate Thank being you, here. Thank you, Supervisor Gore. Um, moving to Mr. Springer, your closing statement. I want to thank you first and your team for all the hard work you guys did to make this possible, all the transition. I want to thank our audience, the folks that are listening throughout the community. Thank you for tuning in. My name's Andy Springer. I'm running for district supervisor in, or supervisor in, in district four. And I got to tell you why. I decided to run because I believe we've had a better California. I believe on my mom, my grandfathers, people on my, 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 my family's side, have been fourth generations in the state and we've had a better California. And frankly, the California being offered right now is not near better nor the best. And Sonoma County is one of those counties that has the greatest opportunity to be a lighthouse to the nation for the way we handle crises like water, like homelessness, like food, like shelter, like everything we're talking about tonight. And I think we're falling short and way short. We need a greater leadership. We need more focus. We need more uh, community effort. And frankly, it's about time the middle class, the poor class, the business class, the property owners, the people across the county took back their government because government belongs to the people and not to not us to them. Let's make a difference this time. Let's vote June 7th and make sure that you vote Andy Springer for, for county supervisor. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Springer. And thank you to both of our District 4 candidates. Moving now to District 2, uh, Mr. Hyenga, you will lead us off with a one minute closing statement. All right, I, I thank you. I thank you for your time. And it's been an honor to be able to speak to you. I am not a career politician. <laughs> this is my first time as being a candidate. My experience in working in the news with Katie Couric, Diane Sawyer, and Barbara Walters made me a good listener and a problem solver. It also strengthened my passion to make a difference, especially from my hometown of Petaluma and Sonoma County. We need members on the board to have the courage to listen to Sonoma County folks, to do what's best for Sonoma County. As an elected official, I will always be available to hear your concerns and ideas day or night. I will meet you where you need me. As supervisor, I am working for you. It's time for a change. It's time to take money out of politics and elect hardworking folk with experience and hardship who will listen to you as a supervisor, to be the government of the people, by the people, for the people. If you care as passionately as I do about moving Sonoma County forward, then vote for me, Kevin Hyenga, for a better future. Join my Facebook group and follow me on Instagram. I look forward to earning your trust. Thank you and may peace be with you all. Thank you, Mr. Hyenga. Uh, Mr. Hooper, you're up next for a uh, one minute closing statement. We need change in South County. I grew up in Petaluma and I grew up with family and friends who struggled the most to get by. And as I've worked for over 10 years in public service and engaged with the most vulnerable in our district, I have seen as more often than not, they are left behind and they fall further and further back. This is why we desperately need a county government that understands its role as a partner with our cities and as a coordinating entry point for many of the services that people need in this county. 
We also have to understand that when it comes to equity here, more than, more than a quarter of this county is filled with communities of color that haven't been treated as part of this community. Diversity for me is not a, a theoretical subject, it's my family. I have had the benefit of living for over 10 years with my wonderful now wife and her family. This is my brother-in-law, my sister-in-law, my mother-in-law, and I've seen as an observer just how many barriers they go through. Please vote for me this June. We need change in South Sonoma County. Please go, for, go to blakehooper.com or Hooper for Super on Facebook. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Hooper. And finally, uh, Supervisor Rabbit with a one minute closing statement. You know, thank you very much. I wanna thank LOCN for organizing tonight's forum. Thank you, Pat, for doing such a great job moderating Fernando for pulling this together. And another shout out to my good friend from SH, Herman. Uh, it's been an honor to serve you as Sonoma County Supervisor. Never in a million years did I think I would run for office, but yet here I am. I'm an architect by profession and owned and operated my own business. Like many, I got involved because of my kids. Uh, first in their schools and then in youth sports. It was the lack of parks and fields and those who sat at the council at the time who turned their back on us that really pushed me to run for the city council. I ran and I won. Two years later, we had a recession and people saw me as someone who was pragmatic, uh, knew the business of uh, running an organization and, and knew how to follow uh, financial things. Um, you know, I am proud to serve on the Petaluma City Council. And having served as an elected official on both the city and the county levels, I understand the roles and responsibilities. I understand that partnership. And uh, I also am an effective member of this board. I bring a unique skill set. I'm mission driven, pragmatic, and I have a proven record of getting things done. I've led on infrastructure, I've led on water, drought, housing, land use, and ensuring the safety net that's out there as well. I serve on more regional boards than my colleagues, and I'm passionate about Sonoma County. I care about its future, and I ask for your vote. Thank you. Thank you, Supervisor Rabbit, and thank you so much, sincerely, on behalf of Los and to all of our candidates for your participation and your candor. Um, and thank you to everyone in the audience for you all being here with us this evening. Uh, the community involvement in Sonoma County is one of the best reasons to call this place home. I think we can all agree. And Los Cien continues to promote challenging conversations to make our common home better for everyone. This has been the first series of debates that we're having. On April 14th, we'll be hearing from the candidates for superintendents of the Sonoma County Office of Education. That event will be virtual, and that one was always planned to be virtual. It will start at 7 p.m., and that event will be moderated by Hector Delgado, uh, director of the Santa Rosa Junior College's Southwest Center. And then on April 28th, the candidates for Sonoma County Sheriff will be joining us. That event will be starting at 6.30 p.m., like this one, and it will be moderated by Kathy Barnett, the former editor-in-chief of the Press Democrat. And that location is to be decided both events, like tonight, will be available in both Spanish and English. To register for these and for any other LOCN events, please visit our website at locn.org. And finally, if you'd like to join us by becoming a member or a partner, we would love to have you. We all can have a role in empowering our Latinx community here in Sonoma County. As we said, issues that affect Latinx people affect all of us. And so we please ask you to consider joining us. It would be an honor to have you as part of Los Cien. And with that, I hope that everyone has a wonderful evening. Que tengan una bonita noche. Gracias por estar con nosotros. Thank you for being with us, everyone. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs>